Okay, so how is everyone today? Good? Very good. Um, so last time we were talking about polynomial functions and uh, we considered the global behavior of polynomial functions. So specifically this is the kind of thing that we did. So we said, okay, we've got a polynomial function Uh, here's an example of a picture of a polynomial function. <coughs> Something like this. Okay, and what we did last time is we said, more or less, this kind of thing. We said, well, uh, we're going to ignore all that stuff I just obscured, and from what you can see, you should be able to tell me uh, the parity of this polynomial. So what's its parity? It's got to be an odd polynomial. It's an odd polynomial because the, the left behavior, the behavior going to the left, and the behavior going to the right are opposite. This is going down, this is going up. So it must be an odd polynomial. Uh, furthermore, you can tell me the sign of the leading coefficient. What is the sign of the leading coefficient? Positive. It's got to be positive. What, what is informing you that it must be positive? The right side's going up. The right side's going up. So that's what we talked about last time. What we're going to talk about this time is, well, okay, now let's kind of, for the most part, ignore the, the eventual behavior, and we want to look at just this bit, the local behavior, which I have been colloquially, colloquially calling the wiggle. How does it wiggle before it starts doing its global behavior? Okay, so specifically, uh, we're going to be interested in this point, this kind of point, and this kind of point. So these are called x-intercepts. That's what we called them when we first started talking about functions. But in the context of polynomials, and in other contexts, but, but very significantly in the context of polynomials, what's the name of these kinds of points? Zeros. They're called zeros. Now the reason why that is a reasonable name for those points is because, for example, if this is x is equal to 5, say, that, and the red is the plot of a polynomial, what do you get if you plug in 5 to the function? You get 0, because it's on the x-axis. It's at height 0. So if you plug in 5, if the input is 5, the output is 0. So we're calling 5 a zero. Now don't don't confuse that with me saying that five is equivalent to zero, of course not. What I'm saying is that when you plug five as input to the function, the output is zero. Similarly, if this is say negative four, you plug it you use input negative four, you get output zero. So they're called zeros. Okay. We're also going to be interested in points like this. So like this one I just marked out. Um, so now, this particular drawing, could is this conceivably the plot of a quadratic polynomial? This couldn't possibly be the plot of a quadratic polynomial because you know the shape of every conceivable quadratic. What's the shape of every conceivable quadratic? A parabola. So my question, could this be the plot of a quadratic is equivalent to asking, is this a parabola? No, right? Parabolas don't look like this. So surely not a quadratic. <coughs> but what I want you to observe is that if you were to cut away everything far away from this point, if you cut it all away and you just look at that, if you just look at that bit, then, well, that kind of does look like a parabola, just that little bit. 
right there. It kind of looks like a parabola that opens down. Similarly, this point, the bottom point, also looks like a parabola when you cut away everything else. It looks like a parabola that opens up. So do you observe that there are a couple other places where stuff like that happens? Right? So here's one, and here's another. So notably, this point is a zero and also the kind of point we're talking about. The name of these points is turning points. And what I'm telling you is that our analysis of polynomial functions breaks is framed in the following way. Is that outside of the box, outside of the box is the global behavior. Inside of the box is the local behavior. We talked about the global behavior last time. We'll talk about the local behavior now. So any question about the way the rest of today will go? <laughs> OK. So we'll start out with the zeros and say, let, let f of x be a polynomial of degree at least one. So, um, it is possible there are polynomials of degree zero. What are the polynomials of degree zero? These are, in a sense, the most boring <coughs> conceivable polynomials. So for example, the function f of x is equal to 8 is a polynomial of degree 0, because just the, just the constant number 8, what's the highest power of x? <laughs> 0, right? x to 0. You could think of it like that. So by, when I say let f of x be a polynomial of degree 0, I'm saying let's consider a polynomial function that's not constant. The constant ones are too boring. The following are equivalent. That's a very common initialism in a math class. The following are equivalent. So 1 f of c equal to 0. In, in English, in language, what you say is that x equals c is a 0 of f of x. 2. x minus c is a factor of f of x. And 3, the point c comma 0 is an x intercept of y is f of x. So all three of these mean exactly the same thing. So let me be so in, in an in attempt to make it make it clear what the what the strength and function of this remark is, is the following. Suppose that we have a drawing like this.
So I could ask, okay, concerning this drawing I just made for you, does it have, uh, and assuming that what I've drawn is a polynomial, uh, does it have any x-intercepts? It does. That means what? That means that does it touch the x-axis anywhere? Sure. It does twice. It does once here and once here. And let's say furthermore that I get out my ruler, or if there was a, if there was a scale, and I read the position of that x-intercept, and let's say that this occurs at five zero. then that knowledge tells you two things. It tells you two further things, because now we know that there's an intercept there. That also tells us that if this is the plot of f, what do you get when you plug in 5? You get 0. <clears throat> but you also know that if you were to take the formula for f and you were to factor it you know one of the factors that must show up what factor simply must show up x minus five must show up so and x minus five is a factor This is sort of like if I gave you some really big number, like 1,348,000, blah, 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 and 6. And because it, because it ends with 6, you know that when you factor this number, what must be one of the factors? 2. 2 has got to be one of them. Because you know all numbers that end with an even unit must themselves be even. So it's sort of, it, it's like that. Okay, suppose that, uh, suppose that I get out my ruler again and measure this point here to be negative 1, comma, 0. So that we found another x-intercept. <clears throat> well, that tells you further, that tells you more information. it tells you that when you plug in negative 1, what do you get? You get 0. But it tells you a further thing. What else does it tell you? Yeah, it says that if you were to factor this polynomial, x minus negative 1, which is to, which is to say x plus 1, must be one of the factors. So now let's use this, this kind of idea in a real problem. Any questions about it? <coughs> OK. So for example, let p of x be mm, 2x squared minus 8x minus 3 multiplied by x minus 7. I've got some nice polynomial there. First question. I want you to um, find the zeros of p of x. Which is to say, I want you to tell me all the x's that when plugged into p, the output will be 0. One, one of them is quite obvious. There, there is a very obvious input that you could give to p that would make the output 0. What, what, what input could we give to p? 7. 
if you plug in a 7, that factor is going to be 0, and who knows what the other one is, but it doesn't matter because that one's 0. Okay, but it remain but the question about are there any others that that's a question right so specifically we want to solve the equation p of x equal 0 so we need to solve 2x squared minus 8x minus 3 multiplied by x minus 7 equal 0. Okay, so we've solved a number of things more quite similar to this, actually. So whenever you're solving an equation and you have a product like this equal to 0, then what must be the case? when you have a product of things equal to zero. Yeah, it must be the case that one or the other is zero. Either that one is zero or that one is zero. So that is to say that this, this equation now, uh, this one equation now splits into two uh, simpler equations. It is either the case that 2x squared minus 8x minus 3 is equal to zero. That's possible. Or it is the case that x minus 7 is equal to 0. If this had been the product of three factors equal to 0, then it would have split into 3. If it had been the product of 10 things equal to 0, it would have split into 10 things. This equation is easy enough. I'll go ahead and do it. So the solution to this one is 7. And how about this one? Who knows, right? <laughs> Could be anything. Well, one of the ways, so in the first place, this is a quadratic equation. And we spent, you know, two weeks or whatever talking about that. So one way to do it would be to factor it. So can you factor this one? It like, is it the easy kind? Where it's like, can I think of two numbers whose product is this and whose sum is that? Well, two numbers whose product is negative 6 whose sum is negative 8. I don't know, I can't think of any. So if you can't think of any, then what is your, what is the tool that does it for you? The quadratic formula. Okay. So for this one, the quadratic formula is necessary. Okay, so x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac. And then all of this divided by 2a. So is there any question why the arithmetic looks just so? OK, then, then we carry this out. Okay, so that'd be 8 plus or minus the square root of, so that'd be 64, and then minus a negative number, so the negatives are going to cancel. So 64 plus 24 is 88. So square root of 88 divide by 4. So now, Let's list out all the zeros. So, so what are the zeros? Well, there's here's two of them, and don't forget that one, right? Okay. So the zeros are eight minus the square root of eighty-eight divide by 4. And the next one is 8 plus the square root of 88 divide by 4 and the last one is 7.
Any question about finding the zeros of p? Okay. <clears throat> Next question. Now, on the previous page, on the previous page, we said the following are equivalent. We said that zeros are equivalent to factors are equivalent to x-intercepts. We said that all of these are they're equivalent. That is to say, they're different ways of thinking about the exact same thing. So now I want you to factor p of x. That is to say, I want you to say, I want you to write out p of x is equal to this times that times that times that times that times that, or whatever. How many individual factors will p of x have? Three? Why, th why not? Why three? Why not five or something? I guess because there are three zeros in f of c is zero. There's three factors. Right, exactly this. That zeros and factors are in direct correspondence to each other. My question about how many factors will, th will there be is equivalent to asking how many zeros are there. There's three of them. Therefore, there'll be three factors. So if there were 12 zeros, there'd be 12 factors. OK, so that means that, means that p of x has three factors. So p of x will look like this. So remember, if c is a 0, then what's a factor? Not, not, not if c is equal to 0. If c, uh, if c is a 0. So what I'm trying to get you to say, because 7 is a 0, what's a factor? x minus 7. 7 is a 0. x minus 7 is a factor. If it, if it were the case that 9 is a 0, then what would be a factor? x minus 9. So it'll be something like x minus, here we have a slot, multiplied by x minus, here we have another slot, multiplied by x minus, here we have a third slot. And what's necessary is just to route the zeros into a slot. So there's three zeros, so there's three slots. So we could say, OK, well, this one, this one goes in here. This one into here. And this one <coughs> to here. So does everyone see the correspondence between zeros and factors? OK, so just write them in then. 8 minus square root 88 divided by 4. 8 plus square root 88 divided by 4 and 7. So now, a slight subtlety that is often overlooked. Is this the factorization of p? It isn't. Now, we do have the, the right number of factors, and, and we have the right factors. We have the, we have the right number, and we have the right factors. So like. This is x minus 7. We did that right instead of accidentally writing x minus 17 or something. Yet, this is not the factorization of p. Why not? Yeah, because why? You're missing this too, right? Which is to say, suppose you were to multiply this out and collect like terms. And we could ignore the arithmetic circus that would result. If you were to multiply this out and collect like terms, what is the highest degree term that you would get doing this? You'd get a cube, right? 
That would be when you take this one, and that one, and that one. And as presently written, if you were to, when you get that cube, what would be its coefficient? It'd be 1. However, if you were to multiply this out and collect like terms, you also would get a cube. But what would be that coefficient? 2. So what's missing here is that we need a 2. It's a good thing I left some horizontal space, huh? 2. Coming from, from this 2 and this implied 1 right there. Any question about factoring p? So notice that if somehow I started you out here, I started you out in this position, and you didn't have any of this, then from here, you should be able to tell me what the zeros are. So here's a factor. What zero corresponds to this factor? 7. Because if you replace, if you replace that little x right there with a 7, then you'd have 7 minus 7. And this factor would be 0, and it doesn't make a bit of difference what these other ones are, because that one's 0. Similarly, if you replace this x, what, what, this is a factor, what 0 corresponds to this factor? Yeah, that, that thing. 8 plus the square root of 88 divided by 4. Because if you take that little x, and you replace it with 8 plus square root 88 over 4, then you'll subtract those and get a zero. This factor will be zero, and it doesn't make any difference what any of the other factors are. So if I started you here, you could tell me the zeros. From here, knowing the zeros, you can tell me the factors. OK. So now, I want you to make a sign chart. P of x, which is to say, I want you to take the real line and carve it into pieces and say, everywhere in this region, P of x is negative, uh, and everywhere in that region, it's positive, etc. Now, when we were doing sign charts before, there's, uh, there were two kinds of places where you could change sign. One of them was 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 where the, the evaluation is 0, which is to say where you solve the equation. What was the other kind? The, that is to say the fence post that we had to draw. One of them were solutions to an equation. What was the other variety? What was it? Restrictions in the domain. That is to say breaks in the domain. Now, cons concerning this uh, polynomial, P, please tell me about the breaks in its domain. Alternatively, please tell me what is the natural domain of this polynomial. All x, right? Because this is a polynomial. The only thing that we're doing with x is we're using x's to multiply, to add and subtract. Nothing can go wrong. If you were using if you were dividing by x's, well you could you could divide by a zero. Something so something could go wrong. But we're not doing that. If you were using radicals, then well, if you had an even radical, you could have negatives in there. But we're not doing that either. So the domain of polynomials is all reals. What that means is that when you're making the sign chart of a polynomial, the only fence posts are these, the zeros, when you're, ma when you're making the sign chart of a polynomial. So there are three zeros, and therefore there are three fence posts. And 
and we need to be we need to carefully put them in the right order, right? <laughs> so who knows what that one is? Not not me. So let's type that into the calculator real quick. Okay, so eight oops. Eight plus the square root of eighty eight divide by no minus. We're doing minus first. Eight minus the square root of eighty eight divide by four. My calculator is reporting to me that this number right here is about negative 0 0.34. And then the next number, 8 plus, blah, blah, that's about, that's about 4.34. And that one is 7. So that means that the fence posts are, I, we, we just so happen to write them in the correct order down here. Okay, so then this would be 8 minus the square root of 88 divided by 4. This, in, this one is 8 plus the square root of 88 divided by 4, and this is 7. Okay, so we drew the fence posts. Now that they're drawn, what's the next step in a sign chart? <clears throat> what are we supposed to do now? Yeah, we need to figure out sample points in each region. So, so that's about negative 0 0.3. So something in this region, how about is negative 1? Is something in here, how about 3? Something in here, how about 6? And then something in here, how about 8? So we select these sample points. And then what are we going to, where do we plug these sample points into? Yeah, and the factorization here. So we we're going to plug all these sample points into the factorization. OK. So 2, well, that's always positive. That's good, so I'll write positive for 2. Uh, if you plug in negative 1 in here, negative 1 minus uh, negative 0.3-ish, uh, well, that's negative 1 plus 0.3-ish, and that's still negative. So that'll be negative. Negative 1 minus 4-ish is negative, and negative 1 minus 7 is negative. So 2 is always positive, and then the other factors are negative. Okay, so in the next region, 2 is positive. If we plug in 3, positive. 3 minus 4-ish is negative, and 3 minus 7 is negative. Okay, then now plugging in 6, 2 is always positive, so I'll write positive for 2. 6 minus a negative number is positive. 6 minus 4-ish is positive. And uh, 6 minus 7 is negative. And then in the last region, all the factors are positive. Is there any question about finding the sign pattern? <clears throat> so the overall sign in each region is then negative, positive, negative, positive. Now as it so happens, on this particular sign chart, the signs were alternating. But they need not alternate. And the next example we do, they're not going to alternate. Which is to say, it's not always going to be negative, then positive, then negative, then positive. It's not going to do that. OK. Now, four, I want you to sketch. Y is P of X. Now, I want you to 
observe the following. Having made the sign chart of this polynomial, you actually now know a great deal about what this polynomial must be doing. So in particular, you can tell me, just looking at the sign chart, what is the parity of p of x? Is this polynomial an odd polynomial or an even polynomial? Odd. So why do you say odd? Yes. So look. Look at the leftmost behavior. The behavior on the left. It is negative. Whereas the behavior on the right is positive. So the behavior left and right is opposite. These are opposite of each other. As a result of these alone, you can ignore everything else. As a result of these alone, this polynomial has odd parity. Another way to see that, besides the chart, is, well, if you were to multiply this all out and collect like terms, what would be the highest degree term? It would be degree 3, because you'd get 2x squared times this x, that would be 2x cubed, 2x to, with exponent 3, which is an odd exponent. Okay, what is the sign... Of the leading coefficient. So on the one hand, you can just look at it right here and say, well, the leading coefficient is 2, and the sine of 2 is positive. But I claim that, that looking at the sign chart alone, you can tell me the sign of the leading coefficient. What is the sign of the leading coefficient? got to be positive. Why does this, why must, according to the sign chart, why must the sign of the leading coefficient be positive? Correct, because the right behavior is positive. The behavior when you go to the right tells you the sign of the leading coefficient. It's got to be positive. It's positive because of this. Now, taking those two behaviors together, you know globally now, we're, we're making a sketch, you know globally how this must appear. Because it's an odd polynomial, that means that one arm is up and one arm is down. So it's either like, it's either like this or like that. This, that's the only two possibilities. Furthermore, you know which one it is. It's got to be the one with the right arm up. This is the only thing it can possibly be. Now, furthermore, besides this, and again, just reading the sign chart, you know zeros of the polynomial. According to, according to the sign chart alone, the zeros are that fence post, that fence post, and that fence post, which is to say 8 plus or minus the square root of 88 over 4, and seven. Now finally, on the, on the previous page, we said the following three things are equivalent. We said, uh, so this is, So we said zeros are equivalent to factors. Zeros are equivalent to factors, which are in turn equivalent to what last thing? Zeros are equivalent to factors, which are equivalent to x-intercepts. 
Therefore, because you know these zeros, and you know three of them, that means that you know three x-intercepts. There's one at negative 0 0.340. Zero. There's one at about 4.340. Zero. And there's one at 7. And what these zeros do, they break the plane into regions, just like the sign chart does. <coughs> but the meaning now that we're going to sketch the polynomial is that, well, in this region, the leftmost region, all of the outputs are negative. That's what the sign chart is saying. When you're drawing the function, that's saying that when you are drawing in this region on the left, are you supposed to be below or above the horizontal axis? You've got to be below, because the outputs are negative. And in between these two zeros, in this region, are you supposed to be drawing below or above? Above, because that's, that's where outputs are positive. So draw below the, the x-axis, above the x-axis. Below the x-axis, above the x-axis. So we have to draw through these three points, one, two, three. And because of the end behavior, we know that we're going to have to start down here, start down here-ish. And we're going to have to end up here. So there's only really one possibility to draw a smooth curve that does all this. Draw from down here to the zero. And then when you get to this zero, when you make it into the next region, you've got to be above. So you've got to go up. So we went up a little bit. And then when you draw, you've got to bend back down to that zero. So we bend back down to it. And then when I get in the next region, I've got to be which one, below or above? Below, because the outputs are negative. So now I'm below, and then I need to, from here, bend back up to that zero, and then just go up. Terrific. Any question about this? Okay, good. Now we do one more. Except now that we did this one so carefully, let's go through the next one rapidly. Suppose I give you the following. Let Q of X is be let q of x equal x plus 3 cubed multiplied by x minus 2 multiplied by x minus 5. So, uh, I, I mean squared. So x plus 3 squared. Okay, so then now, 1, let's find the zeros. Okay, well, this is not much of a question, really, because of the way I wrote Q for you. But I did that because we only have so many minutes left. <coughs> so this is, this is a really straightforward question because of the way I wrote it. So what is the answer? Negative 3, 2, and 5. Okay, then I could ask, Okay, now I want you to factor Q. Oh, but I gave it to you factored, right? I, I did this because we're just running short on time. So, haha, -ha, right? But do understand that in a, in a real exercise that you, you really would have something to do, just like you had something to do on the last exercise. Okay, then three, let's make a sign chart.
Okay. Well. Because there's three zeros, this sign chart also will have three fence posts. And they are negative three, two, and five. Some sample points are negative four, one, three, and six. So if we sample Q here at these places and use this factorization here, then we would get something like mm, negative squared multiplied by negative multiplied by negative in the left region. In the next one, we would get positive squared multiplied by negative multiplied by negative. In the next region, positive squared multiplied by positive multiplied by positive, and then finally all of them positive. Positive squared multiplied by positive multiplied by positive. I, yeah, I agree entirely. I'm not sure what, it, what happened there. Positive, squared, positive, negative. Okay. <clears throat> so the overall sign then in each region uh, will be positive and then positive some more and then negative and then positive. And what I would like for you to note is that, note, the signs are not alternating. Because the first two signs are positive. OK. Knowing this now, let's make a sketch. So we know the parity. What is the parity of Q? Even. The sign chart is telling you it's even. Why is the sign chart telling you the parity is even? In what way is it telling you it's even? Yeah. The starting and ending signs are the same. Uh, then, so it's even parity. How about the sign of the leading coefficient? Positive. And we know the zeros. They are negative 3, 2, and 5. As a result, we can plot these three zeros. So negative 3, 2, and 5. These zeros cut the plane into regions where the outputs must all be above or below. So now, in the leftmost region, will we need to start out above or below? Above. Then in the rightmost region, will we need to end up above or below? Above. <coughs> Okay, so we need to start high, wiggle through these points, and end high. Okay, so if I start up here, then I need to head toward the zero. So now, when I get to the zero, will I need to cross the x-axis? No, we've got to bounce off of it, because we're going to go from a positive region to another positive region. So we're going to bounce off of this zero. So we bounced off of it. Now I've got to head back toward that zero. Will I cross or will I bounce? Cross. I'll cross. You can see that because that is a sign change. So I cross. And now I need to head back toward that zero. And when I get there, will I bounce or cross? Cross.
Interesting. So, and here's the last thing that I want you to think about over the weekend. So, concerning this polynomial that we just sketched, and this factorization, if we, if we were to take these two factors and delete them, then that's how Q would look if we deleted those two that I'm covering up. And it would be a quadratic, right? Which means it would be shaped like a parabola. Well, that factor corresponds to this zero. And if you cover up that much of the polynomial, you see something that looks like a parabola. Similarly, if we delete that term and that <coughs> term so that q of x looks like x minus 2, then q of x equal to x minus 2, that would be a line. <coughs> and that factor, x minus 2, corresponds to that 0, which looks like a line. And so here's the punchline for today, the thing that we'll end on, is that zeros have parity. just a moment, is that if we took a zero of a polynomial and we cut it out, and we took another zero and cut it out, so we cut out two different zeros, then all the zeros of the, of the polynomial either look like this, this kind of thing, or this kind of thing, <coughs> which is to say that there's a sign change at the transition or there's a sign repetition at the transition. These ones are odd, and these ones even. And this is where we'll begin on Monday. So have a nice weekend.